Welcome to Daybreak Australia. I'm Heidi Stradwatts in Sydney. We're counting down to Asia's major market opens. I'm Annabelle Drawlers in Singapore and the top stories this hour. Traders weighing mixed economic data and hawkish leading Fed commentary for clues on the rate cut outlook. Wall Street's return from holidays dominated by a sell-off in bonds. Australia's April inflation numbers are coming out later with economists expecting CPI to tick lower while still facing pressure from rents, insurance and fuel prices. And Toyota shareholders being urged to revolt over the company's plan to re-elect chairman Akio Toyota. A lot to contend with, particularly here in Australia, as we look ahead to those CPI numbers, expecting still quite some pressure when it comes to the RBA being able to uh, look towards the possibility of easing sooner rather than later. We also have sort of expectations when it comes to uh, retail as well as consumer sentiment looking a little bit softer there as well. So uh, when it comes to how we're setting up for the inflation data here in Sydney, down by about six tenths of one percent at how futures are trading. This, of course, we had that big drop in treasuries that mostly dominated uh, the the U.S. session as, of course, U.S. markets and investors came back after the Memorial Day long weekend there. Kiwi stocks are holding pretty steady, about a tenth of one percent higher ahead of the announcement of uh, the new government's budget. Finance Minister Willis will be delivering the first budget on Thursday. They seem to be posting bigger budget deficits as well as more levels of borrowing, but they will be pressing ahead with tax cuts despite the weaker revenue outlook. So that's one to watch out for when it comes to trading in New Zealand. Chicago Nikkei futures looking a little bit tepid at this point and uh, A50 China futures with the latest property sort of headlines uh, off by about a tenth of one percent bell. Yeah, and Heidi, you mentioned those moves that came through in the bond space on Wall Street, and really that's where we saw most of the action. We saw the 10-year yield, for instance, up eight basis points. Actually, U.S. stocks were little changed, and you're seeing U.S. futures coming online this morning again. Fairly steady right now. It is that countdown to the Fed's preferred inflation gauge that's due at the end of the week. But ahead of that, we actually had the U.S. consumer confidence figures out as well, and those unexpectedly rose in May, and that was for the first time in four months. So it's views about business conditions, the labor market, they're actually becoming less negative even though recession expectations those increased as well and you put that against the backdrop of these uh, fed moves and and we're still hearing more hawkish commentary coming through from fed officials the 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 bank of minneapolis president neil kashkari the latest here but he's saying that yes the stance is restrictive there's still though the odds or chances perhaps of further increases from here take a listen i've been asked many times would we take potential interest rate increases off the table. I don't think anybody has formally taken them off the table. Even, even me, uh, I say that we could sit here for as long as necessary until we get convinced that inflation is sustainably going back down to our 2% target. I'm not ruling out potential interest rate increases from here, but I think sitting where we are for an extended period of time is a more likely outcome. But of course, if we get surprised by the data, then we would do what we need to do. Let's get more insights with our first guest. Sarah Malik is CIO at Nuveen. And, and Sarah, of course, we, we do want to also point out Neil Kashkari. He's one of the most hawkish on the FOMC. But is this something that you've got at all in your thinking as well, that we still have that outside chance of a rate hike? Or do you think that we're just in a pattern where we stay higher for longer? I definitely think we're in a pattern of higher for longer, but whether we get another hike will depend on if inflation reaccelerates again like it did earlier this year. Now, the good news is recent CPI and PPI data has come in in line, so inflation is showing signs of no longer reaccelerating. With PCE data later this week, we think that comes in also in line with consensus. That will be good news for the markets. You know, the areas to focus on with PCE will be portfolio management, given how the markets have risen, healthcare, and also airfares. But all of that together, I think still we need to wait for inflation to get to a more moderate level for a longer period of time before we see those first rate cuts. And I would say there is still a small chance that rate hikes could be back on the table if inflation reaccelerates again. I guess one of the, the, the key questions out of that, though, can the, the U.S. economy continue to grow when you've got that inflationary environment and also you've got those rate headwinds? I mean, that is the main question for investors. Can the economy withstand higher interest rates and higher inflation? If you look at the markets this year, they've been fairly narrow, driven by artificial intelligence with NVIDIA wrapping up earnings season very strongly last week, and also earnings in the economy. First quarter earnings also very strong in the U.S. with 80% of companies beating consensus. And economic data has been 
fairly mixed on the manufacturing side, but as we saw today, consumer confidence coming in strong. So the economy remains pretty strong, and all of that is showing us that the economy so far can grow through these higher rates and inflation. But whether that will be where we are at the end game or if we will hit a recession is still the question that's on the table. And given that uncertainty in terms of how much growth and the pace of that growth, as Bell sort of pointed out, does that mean you're better off looking at international markets that are seeing strong returns? The likes of Japan, as you say, even with all the exuberance over the Japanese equity rally, there are a lot of global portfolios that are still underweight. The international markets have been promising this year. We look at currency and also inflation data outside of the U.S. First of all, with currency, if the U.S. moves to rate cuts, and the economy starts to slow and the U.S. dollar weakens, that would be positive and favorable for international markets. Japan is an area that's benefited from reshoring, reopening, and reflation. Strong consumer, strong, stronger GDP growth, and mild inflation for Japan are reasons that we think Japan can continue to perform well. And global portfolio managers have been underweight the Japanese equity markets. China is another area to think about here. It is showing some signs of a resurgence. I would like to see more stability in the Chinese property market before knowing if this is going to be a long-term recovery for China at this point. Do you prefer ex-China when it comes to emerging markets? Yeah, I think you cannot ignore China given its weight in the emerging markets benchmark, but areas such as Mexico, which benefit from nearshoring and onshoring with the U.S. as China gets hurt by less trade. I think there's other emerging markets which have longer term structural trade tailwinds right now, such as Mexico, also Indonesia with its younger population benefiting because of the issues China is having. But like I said, we are seeing some green shoots in China with better luxury spending data and um, other areas that are starting to show that China may be showing some signs of a recovery. And, you know, you mentioned the issue of trade and some of the risks. How much attention are you paying to geopolitical concerns at the moment, particularly as we get closer to the U.S. election in November and particularly as we, you know, have had more and more noise about the, 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 the discontent from Western trading partners towards China? Well, I think definitely the election is going to be a big issue this year. We have 77 countries going to the polls at 60 percent of GDP. So that is a heightened year for elections. The good news is U.S. markets tend to perform well during an election year, which is what we're seeing. You know, as in terms of trade with China, I think we'll have to see you know, how the elections shake out and, and whether tariffs, you know, what, what happens with tariffs going forward, what happens with trade. I think the clear beneficiary still remains countries that are closer to the U.S., like Mexico, and also infrastructure within the U.S. should continue to benefit. That's been a key sector call for us because we think the U.S. will bring more manufacturing back home, and not only because of trade issues, but also since the pandemic, I think we want our supply chains closer to home. That's a trend that we're seeing. Infrastructure is also interesting because a lot of people are looking at it more from the AI play as well, uh, given power needs, for instance. Uh, what are you seeing in, in, in the AI space in particular? Which areas are you seeking to benefit from? Well, infrastructure, as you mentioned, benefits from multiple trade uh, tailwinds, not only manufacturing coming closer to home, but also for renewable energy as we need to upgrade our grids, artificial intelligence and bringing more manufacturing closer to home. Infrastructure benefits from all of those. It's also economically resilient because the pieces within infrastructure are utilities and waste management. And of course, during a recession, we tend to take out our garbage still and of course, turn on our lights. So infrastructure is a resilient economic play. Artificial intelligence is, is a beneficiary not only for the US, but for the rest of the world with Japan and its aging demographics. I think artificial intelligence can help boost productivity there across sectors from healthcare, which uses tons of data. AI can bring us more rapid to the market drugs. So I think AI is going to be something that benefits many companies and sectors around the world. And then just looking at some other points in your notes, so when it comes to how you can sort of position around a slowdown, private credit is something else that you're looking at quite favorably? Yeah, private credit tends to be an area that is more resilient during an economic downturn. And we're looking at our, at our portfolios, you know, looking for offense and defense. So being more defensive as markets continue to rise, these are areas like infrastructure, dividend growers within equities, companies that tend to continuously increase their dividends, private credit in the alternative space, but then also not funding those from technology, which I think has very strong structural tailwinds going forward. AI, of course, is a real trend. It's not just hype. So these large technology companies like NVIDIA don't even look extremely expensive at this point. As a matter of fact, NVIDIA is still trading at a discount to the semiconductor space.
Sarah, always great to chat with you uh, about some of those investment ideas. Sarah Malik is a CIO at Naveen. You can, of course, get a roundup of the stories you need to know to get your day going in today's edition of Daybreak. Terminal subscribers can find that at Daybreak Go. It's also right there on the mobile in the Bloomberg Anywhere app, and you can always customise those settings for the news on the industries and assets that matter most to you. This is Bloomberg. South Africa's most important election since the end of apartheid focuses on infrastructure challenges, economic growth, and political fragmentation. Bloomberg's Jennifer Zabasaja reports live from key battlegrounds in Johannesburg, Cape Town, and Durban. We think that South Africa is an exciting part of the world. South Africa is a thriving and vibrant democracy. There's a lot of expectation for the election. Continuing coverage today on Bloomberg Television. Context changes everything. Israeli tanks have reached the center of Rafa as a sign that the military could be nearing its goal of taking full control of the city. Residents have been reporting clashes between Israeli and Hamas forces in the center of town. Let's bring Michael Heath now for the latest. And, Mark, of course, it comes on the back of that, uh, the horrific scenes that we've come from the refugee camp. Um, international criticism seems to be reaching fever pitch, but this is an operation that is still going ahead. Yeah, I, I think that um, what we're seeing is, is just confirmation of what Prime Minister Netanyahu and, and uh, the Israeli government have said the whole time, that they must go in here, um, that there's, there's still uh, groups of militants that need to be taken out. It's probably where the hostages are. They suspect where it's where the military leadership of Hamas is, so they won't be stopping uh, going into, into Rafah. And there's also tunnels which bring in weapons from Egypt as well, which they're trying to block up. So, yes, that's going to continue. And, um, of course, we saw that terrible airstrike on, on uh, Sunday that, that killed 45 uh, people, including women and children. Um, and there's quite an interesting discussion going on about that because the U.S. has said that didn't cross its red line, which was very surprising given it was a, a missile strike in a, in a heavily, you know, in, in a tent city, basically. Um, but there's also reports coming out of Israel, and it's real fog of war stuff of, of what really happened there. But they're saying that they use very, very small munitions in that strike and that potentially it hit an arms depot or an ammunition dump. And so it was a secondary explosion that caused that. Now, what the truth is, we, we won't know until there's an investigation. But when you have 1.4 million people in a very small area and you're conducting fighting, this is unfortunately, you know, these terrible scenes are going to happen. But I don't think that Israel will stop until this is concluded. The problem is that it's just as, as likely that the militants or the leadership will melt away and turn up somewhere else in Gaza. So it's real whack-a-mole stuff that Israel's uh, conducting here. And that's why the world is so frustrated, because even if you take rougher, it doesn't mean this is over or that Hamas is finished. And, yeah, I mean, Michael, how do you even know that, that Hamas is finished? What's going to be, what's it going to take for Israel to say, yes, this is fair, complete, we've, we've, we're done here? Well, presumably, I mean, it would, it would be if they get uh, Sinwa, the, the military head, and he, he seems to be the, 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 the real brains of the operation. He he's seems to be an incredibly, I mean, outside of being quite murderous, obviously, uh, incredibly uh, talented and, and, and has a great handle on how Israel, its society, its politics, its government works. And he's, he's operated this particularly well. I mean, leaving aside, you know, tens of thousands of people being killed, which is obviously tragic, but for Hamas that doesn't really matter. All that does is, is um, produce the, situ the global pressure, that is which is exactly what Hamas wants on Israel. Now, even if they, if they were to kill or capture Sinwa, um, you know, this sort of trauma that, that, the Palestinian, that the people of Gaza have been through is only going to radicalise another generation. So whether it's Hamas, whether it's Islamic Jihad, whether it's a new organisation that hasn't been formed yet, until you have a political solution, it won't end. But for Israel, for Netanyahu, I think if they captured Sinwa or if they killed him, they would declare that mission accomplished. Um, he, he is obviously a, an extremely talented uh, militant, um, you know, in, in, in very bad ways, obviously, but uh, he is the brains of the operation. So I think that would be what they'd call victory. Um, but short of that, it would just be to clear the militants from that area. But as I say, they're more than likely to, to melt away and pop up elsewhere. So, um, you know, that Israel can almost declare victory whenever they want after they've been through Rafa, but will it conclude? I don't think so. And that complicates the, the, the post-war 
uh, image of, of what Gaza or what this area is going to look like, right? There's been talk about sending blue helmets in, but even the UN says this is wildly complicated in terms of how they can they rebuild. Yeah, I mean, it's going to, it's going to take a huge amount of money and it's going to require um, Arab nations being in, in, in there. I mean, any, any blue helmets or Israeli forces or whoever are going to be targeted by local people there. And, and reasonably enough, it's their territory. Um, outsiders have, have levelled it. Um, and, and, you know, as I say, there'll be, be a lot of radicalisation that goes on there. So it really is going to need Saudi money and, and um, Gulf states in there providing troops to, to help um, rebuild. But until Israel gets on board with, with the prospect of a Palestinian state, that's unlikely to happen. And Israel getting on board for a Palestinian state is very unlikely to happen too, which is the conundrum that we, uh, we find ourselves in today, unfortunately. Bloomberg's Mark O'Heat there. With the latest, there's more to come here on Daybreak Australia. This is Bloomberg. Well, China's biggest cities, including Shanghai, Shenzhen and Guangzhou, have eased down payments for home they have eased requirements for home down payments and mortgages. It follows China's most forceful package, rescue package for its embattled property sector, with $41 billion in funding to buy unsold homes. For more, let's bring in Shanghai Bureau Chief Charlie Zhu. And, and Charlie, it remains to be seen, of course, whether this loosening is going to be what finally tempts buyers back in. But what are the, the signals and what's the sense on that so far? Yeah, that, that's, uh, that just shows how worried the, the Chinese government, you know, is, is you know, about the, the country's, uh, the property sector and also the economy. And as you mentioned, you know, just two weeks ago, uh, China just announced, you know, 300 billion yuan worth of uh, central bank funding to help local governments buy unsold uh, houses. I mean, 300 billion yuan seems a lot of money, but, you know, uh, it's just a drop in the bucket compared with uh, the sheer size of the inventory, which is worth, you know, uh, anything uh, you know more than uh, between like five to six to even you know eight eight trillion yuan, so it's not enough. You know the key is to you know revive public uh, confidence uh, in the housing market. To you know you need to get the you know get the households you know uh, to to buy the the the, the unsold properties. Uh, so that's why uh, the you know the, the the announcement came out last night that you know China will announce uh, will cut uh, the down payment and mortgage rates. Uh, for uh, for people uh, in uh, for housing market in Shanghai, Guangzhou, uh, Shenzhen, you know, all the uh, so-called mega cities in China. Uh, but you know, you, it remains to be seen whether uh, how, how effective the measures will be. You know, the the, the question is, you know, the people are not uh, in China are not confident about their uh, income. Uh, youth employment remains uh, stubbornly high. It's the official rate is about 14, 15 percent at the moment. Uh, Xi Jinping uh, at the Politburo study session last night you know, just you know, said, emphasized the need to boost youth unemployment and urge uh, to you know, create more jobs in key industries. And as you say, this is about lifting broader sentiment and you know, injecting some animal spirits back into the broader economy and the consumer. We've done a recent survey of some economists looking at China. Have the recent policy support measures made, made a meaningful difference when it comes to their outlook? Uh, we did a, a, a flash survey of some economists uh, this week, uh, you know, the, the impact this, uh, most of the economists see from the housing policy uh, on the economy is pretty limited. Uh, the estimate is, you know, uh, the estimated boost is only like 0 0.1, 0 0.4, 0 0.4 percentage points, which is, you know, uh, you know, very small. Uh, so the reality is, you know, um, people in China are, you know, are not after you know the years of uh, uh, runaway growth, you know uh, it's in a con consolidation period. Uh, the financial news report, you know, uh, the central bank newspaper uh, just recently released a media report uh, or a news uh, report recently. It's about the the growth in 
uh, savings in China's banking system. You know, the rate, you know, the, 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 the amount of total savings in, the, in banks, you know, has risen sharply over the past few years. And a lot of that is locked in fixed rate uh, accounts. So that just shows, you know, uh, a lack of uh, confidence about, uh, you know, uh, income. And, and that's the, the biggest headache the government is facing, you know, get the consumer to, to spend again. Shanghai Bureau Chief Charlie Zhu there. We're staying with uh, Eco Data and Australia's April inflation print due out in a few hours. Bloomberg Economics seeing CPI edging lower, but some factors could still be pushing prices in a different direction. Our economics reporter Swati Pandey joins us now for more. And Swati, uh, some of these same sort of elements could continue to create pressure. And, and, I, and I do wonder how important is this print for the RBA and its deliberations? Um, it's really important. Usually monthly inflation data is considered to be volatile and it's also new. Um, so the RBA does not put a lot of weight on it. But this is the most latest price information that they will receive before their June meeting, uh, the June 17, 18th meeting. So they definitely do want to see if prices continue to head in the direction that they want uh, or not. And so it will heavily uh, be debated or discussed in their um, June meeting. And we will also get a GDP report next week. Uh, so these two will be really critical in, in the meeting. And what is sort of the, the, the trajectory of inflation? Because, for instance, we've seen in New Zealand there's a big issue around housing. That's, that's these sort of non-tradables. Is it a similar situation in Australia where you've got those components of the inflation basket that are just really not edging lower? That is right, Annabelle. We do have those components like services, uh, insurance, education costs. Uh, they have been really sticky, and the RBA has also repeatedly said that is um, the sore point for them as well, and which is why the RBA's forecast actually shows inflation is remaining around this 3.2%, 3 3.3% until the end of 2025. Uh, that is different from the government's forecast. Government is expecting uh, inflation will fall back into the target this year because of some of the measures they have taken, uh, such as uh, reducing electricity prices, um, uh, rent assistance. Uh, so the government is trying to work on that services part of inflation. Um, and RBA's forecast came before the budget, before the government announced these measures in the budget. Uh, so we are yet to see uh, those effects. Those uh, measures will kick in uh, from July. So it will not be in, to in uh, today's data. Uh, but that is something the RBA and the government both will keep an eye out for. How worried would they be about the consumer? Because you know th that's been in the doldrums for quite some time now. Yes. Um it is it is a big problem for the RBA because they want to engineer a soft landing. Mm. Uh, they want to ensure that they are able to preserve the employment gains uh, as they bring prices down. Uh, consumer is the weakest link at the moment. Consumer sentiment is really weak. Uh, we had retail sales data yesterday, which was very, very weak as well. Um, and that is a worry for them. Uh, but I think when, when RBA Governor Michelle Bullock talks about consumer spending or spending in the economy, she's still saying that overall demand continues to exceed the economy's capacity to supply. So they are not worried as yet. Uh, but I think when if we start seeing, let's say, loan defaults um, and things like that, or if it starts leading to a recession in the economy because household consumption is such a huge part of Australia's economy, uh, that is when they will be really worried. Mm. Swati Pandey, their economics reporter, ahead of the CPI numbers are out a little bit later. More to come here on Daybreak Australia. This is Bloomberg. Watching Daybreak Australia, taking a look at one of the currency pairs in focus this morning. That is the, how the yen is trading against the British pound. And you can see here we are at a level we have not seen going back 16 years. What is driving that? Again, it really comes down to these interest rate differentials and these expectations as well around where rates go from here. So you've got the Japanese yen, of course, weaker 
BOJ still uh, staying relatively dovish, even though we have seen that path perhaps to further hikes. And then you've also got the view that's developing that UK interest rates are going to be staying higher than most others in the G10 countries. Uh, the BOE really set to lag behind its peers when it comes to easing. So again, essentially what we're hearing here is that even another hike from the BOJ isn't really going to do much to dissuade traders from picking nearly any other major currency over the yen. And so that's a state of play as well. We're, we're tracking the euro versus the yen, for instance, around 170, but also just the, the dollar versus the yen. And, and that's been a very keenly watched uh, pair, given you're, you're at that 157 level. And Heidi, of course, 160, really perhaps seen as the line in the sand for the BOJ, where we'd see any sort of possible intervention. Uh, and, Bell, we can get some more sort of uh, thoughts in terms of this policy gap and the inflation outlook in general. We're going to head back to the UBS Asian Investment Conference, well underway in Hong Kong. Our next guest is one of the speakers uh, at the event and a co-recipient of the 2018 Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences. Joining us now is Paul Romer, who's a professor at Boston College. He previously served as a chief economist at the World Bank. Paul, great to have you with us. And, you know, as we talk about rate divergence and how a lot of these global economies and central banks are at the mercy of what the Fed does next. I did perhaps want to start with you when it comes to your interpretation to what the inflation and growth picture is and that fine balance of risks for the US at the moment. Yes. Yeah. Well, th there's one fact that I think is helpful for interpreting what's going on. The raw inflation numbers from month to month have a very strong seasonal pattern. It's very low at the end of the year. It, the monthly inflation rate is much higher in January, February, and March. And so uh, even though they try to do seasonal adjustment to take out those, effect, th those effects, there's a tendency to look every January, February, March and say, oh my gosh, we're losing the fight against inflation. And it's just people are confusing the seasonals with the, the underlying trend. We're past that now. I think what you're going to see is more recognition that inflation in the United States at least continues to come down, maybe a little bit slower than people uh, would like, but uh, there's uh, every reason to be confident that we'll get where we, we need to go. Are you also confident that a soft landing can be engineered, you know, namely for the Fed, but a number of other economies that are struggling with the same conundrum, right? How to sort of support the strength in the consumer, uh, retain gains in the labor market, uh, but not have growth run away to a point where uh, structural inflation becomes such an issue? Yeah, well, um, each country is going to be somewhat different. The United States has benefited from a consensus that we need to do a significant amount of public investment. And so public investment ever since COVID has been providing a, a real boost. First, uh, stimulus payments, then public investment have been providing a real boost to the, to the U.S. economy. So I think the odds of a soft landing are very high in the, in the U.S. Uh, we also seem to have inflation expectations that are pretty well anchored. And we just had this blip associated with the, uh, the war in Ukraine. So um, I think the odds in the U.S. of a soft landing are good. I think in other countries, you've got to look at those specifics and see how they line up or differ relative to the U.S. What are you thinking, though, in terms of the U.S. consumer? Because I think we've been looking, for instance, we just saw confidence rising for the first time in four months. But do you think we're perhaps overstating the health of the U.S. consumer, given that there's a large part of the population that's really struggling with these rate increases? Yeah, I think that there's, uh, it, it, we may be overstating a little bit the health of the consumer, but yet the consumers are not really the ones who are driving uh, the economy right now. It's really investment, and the government is the, is the key actor there. And for strategic reasons, for uh, climate change reasons, I think there's uh, every reason to expect this to continue. What about the trade piece? Because I know you've spoken at length about you know, the, the sort of complex nature of trade policy and how free trade doesn't always benefit all. And we come to a very interesting juncture where, of course, industrial yeah. policy, trade policy is seeing a lot of the things that you say are necessary, like sanctions, like tariffs, like export controls and subsidies. Do you think these parallel moves that we're seeing from the EU, from China, from the US are on the right track? Well, I, I, I think they're inevitable. Um, you know, COVID made every country realize how vulnerable it was to 
outsourced offshore uh, supply of things like masks. Uh, this looming uh, military conflict, this possibility of a conflict with China has made the United States and Europe very worried about the supply of chips. So I think there's going to be an inevitable tendency to try and onshore certain kinds of critical uh, production uh, activities. Uh, beyond that, as, as I've said and as you mentioned, um, there's a growing recognition that we need to do something to make sure that economic growth benefits all members of a society. And the commitment to free trade didn't have that characteristic. We always said, well, we could supplement it with some other measure that makes sure that nobody gets left behind, but we never did that. So we either have to get serious about finding ways to provide uh, growth and hope uh, for uh, all members of the US economy and, and every economy, and if that means pulling back to some extent on the commitment to free trade, I think it's inevitable that we'll do that. You've also talked about how there should be less focus on the focus uh, on the trade of goods, uh, rather, as opposed to the focus on the trade of, of ideas. Is it a bit of a conundrum at this point when you take a look at uh, tech, like semiconductors, like AI, where it, it kind of is the trade of both? Yep. Yeah, well, the thing, the thing to remember was the deal that was done between the United States and Japan during the, the 70s and 80s when the, the Jap, Japan was producing so many cars of higher quality than the U.S. cars. What the U.S. said is fine. It's good for U.S. consumers to have well-made cars using the knowledge that the Japanese manufacturers have, but we want those cars to be made inside the United States. So you can use mechanisms like direct foreign investment to uh, import the knowledge that a country or a firm offshore has developed, but you can still uh, source uh, the goods, do the production within your own borders. And this is, for example, what we're doing with, with chips right now. We're investing in Intel, but we're also investing in uh, the Taiwanese uh, manufacturers to come and set up production in the United States. It seems like, though, there's also a bit of a trade-off here at play because you have that focus perhaps on reshoring or bre building out a sovereign capacity in these areas. But then you also have that greater scrutiny we're seeing, for instance, of, of deals where you've got, for instance, uh, Nippon's proposed taker of U.S. steel that's being possibly blocked at this point in time. Yeah. 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 Some of this is, is politics, and I think it's a hard distinction to convey to the voters which is that we don't care who the owners of a corporation are, which is actually, it's kind of unclear who exactly owns these companies anyways. What we care about, though, is where the manufacturing takes place. And it's a little bit too easy for our rhetoric to become kind of just a uh, blanket hostility to, to foreigners, and, and we should avoid that. We benefit a great deal from direct foreign investment and uh, the kind of takeover that was proposed in this case, and I, I think we shouldn't have uh, re resisted that. You mentioned, of, of course, that focus on Intel and chip makers, and it is that sort of leads me really to think about AI and where we're at in that story and, and, and some of your most interesting commentary, although of course it's a lot of interesting commentary, but it has been on AI and, and your views really on, on perhaps yeah. our thinking around it and, and being the next big revolution could be a little bit misplaced. Yeah, um, I think we have to remember there was this solid consensus only a couple of years ago that cryptocurrencies were going to change everything. And then suddenly uh, that consensus just goes away. Nobody even asks, gee, why were we so confident? And then it, it, it blew up. So I think right now there's way too much confidence about the future trajectory of AI. What's clear is that AI has made real progress. You can do things with it now that you couldn't do two years ago, five years ago. But when people project this forward, I, I think they're at risk of making a very serious mistake. The problem is, is we've, we've benefited from scaling up compute and ingesting a whole lot of data. Scaling up compute's pretty easy. It's just more machines, more chips. But what's going to happen is we're not going to have enough data. We're going to get through this burst of ingestion of data. There isn't enough data to keep the rate of progress going that everybody has seen uh, recently. And this is already showing up with autonomous vehicles. This was the killer application for AI cars that would drive themselves. And what we're finding is we don't have enough data about those rare events 
that uh, cause these autonomous systems to misbehave and, and kill people. So the rapid progress recently shouldn't be extrapolated into comparable process progress going forward. Things are going to slow down a lot. And what we're, what we're also experiencing right now is just a lot of hype. The typical bubble hype where people are trying to cash in on, on the, the latest trend. So I, I promise you when we talk in two years, we're going to look back and say, yeah, it really was a bubble. We overestimated uh, where it was going. And uh, here's, the new, here's the new thing. Uh, hopefully it won't be two years before we speak to you again, but uh, I, I do wonder whether part of that froth, as you say, the bubble has obviously been uh, extraordinarily loose monetary policy framework over the past few years, right? Uh, on that, when it comes to what the Fed does and the restriction more of US, of US capital as rates, you know, you know ultimately uh, change direction, d do you think that's going to have a massive impact when it comes to the flow of capital to other parts of the world, to emerging markets? Yeah, well, I, I think it's a good thing here to just be sure and acknowledge how little we know um, as economists, anybody knows. For example, when we saw this burst of inflation caused by the, you know, the, the war and food prices, energy prices, almost everybody thought, all of us thought, that the Fed would have to cause an increase in unemployment to bring inflation down. We were wrong about that. And so we need to admit that we don't always know what's going on. The big uncertainty right now is where will real rates, the, say the Fed funds rate minus the inflation rate, where will that settle down? We got used over the last decade or two to extremely low real rates, but that period may have been an anomaly. It was the tail end of this long process of disinflation that started with Paul Volcker. It may be that we're going back now to a more normal period with real rates that are, that are positive. That will be good in some ways. It will reduce the risks of these kind of speculative bubbles, uh, but it will cause some, some major readjustments because people have, I think, largely been investing on the assumption that we're going to go back to uh, essentially zero real rates. And uh, right now, we just, we just don't know. So once everybody agrees the inflation's done, we're just going to be at steady as you go. We don't know what Fed funds rate or what Fed fund rate minus inflation, the inflation rate, we don't know what that number is going to be. And I suppose that goes to the longer term kind of structural nature of what uh, these price pressures look like, right? And yeah. do you think there is a sense that as long as the Fed stays higher for longer that they are sucking capital away from other markets, from emerging markets? Um, I think that's probably not the right way to think about it. I think we just, you know, the Fed needs to be, I think the thing that they need to be most clear about that they have not been clear about is how fast do we want inflation to come down? If we stipulate that we want inflation to go down lower, there's still a question, should we be happy with a process where this happens gradually over time or do we need to get there right away? And the Fed has not been clear about this. My argument has been, we've seen steady, continuous decreases in inflation. So there's no reason to be more uh, aggressive and risk causing, uh, causing a, a recession. The Fed should say, as long as it's coming down, we're happy. And I think that may even mean they, they should say, we're happy and we need to start unwinding some of the interest rate increases that we, we know are not going to be sustained. Wherever the Fed funds rate stabilizes, it's going to be at a level lower than where we are now. That was Paul Romer there, professor at Boston College. Thanks very much for your insights. And we'll have more ahead on Daybreak Australia. This is Bloomberg. Time's running out on BHP's ambitious $49 billion takeover plan for Anglo-American. The two sides remain at odds over the Aussie giant's complicated transaction structure ahead of a Wednesday deadline. So get more on that now with our energy and commodities editor, Andrew James. And, and Andrew, this has really been the key sticking point. It's been the structure of the deal and, and the two sides still yet to really come to, to terms on it. That's right, Annabelle. Um, the sort of the main problem is over uh, BHP's requirement that Anglo 
spin-off majority stakes in a couple of South African miners. Um, Anglo argues that that's going to create too much risk for its own shareholders, which are going to end up owning uh, those the shares in those miners. Um, according to Bloomberg's uh, reporting on both sides of the deal, they're really struggling to find a resolution. Anglo either want a change to the structure or they want additional um, compensation uh, for their own shareholders. So it's unclear if they're going to get to a resolution before the deadline, which is 5 p.m. in London today. Um, it could be a situation where um, BHP will have to uh, apply for an extension with the UK regulatory authorities. It's um, and it's unclear if Anglo would agree to that. Um, if you look at Anglo's share price at the moment, it's 14% below the value implied by BHP's latest offer, which suggests the market doesn't think uh, it's gonna, the, late, the current proposal is really gonna get there and BHP may have to sweeten the offer somehow. You know, in the meantime, we see copper resuming gains uh, and the long-term bull case for copper is still pretty strong, right? Is there a sense that Anglo could just wait because, you know, in a couple of years there might be more competition after a restructure? Yeah, well, as you identify, copper is the, the main reason behind this deal. Um, it's obviously extremely important to the energy transition. It's used in wind turbines, solar panels, energy storage system, grid, grids which are going to need massive upgrades to cope with a lot more renewables. So that's the main reason uh, BHP wants Anglo. Anglo's become attractive to it over the last year because of some of its own setbacks which has seen its share price drop. Um, Anglo actually has its own plan to restructure and that involves uh, spinning off its platinum business and ex exiting um, diamond mining and coal. Um, I mean, this is a good this is good timing uh, for BHP, I think, given uh, where Anglo's share price is at. Um, the fact a Anglo is, has sort of strong roots in South Africa and employs a lot of people there, the fact that this is happening just before a South African election potentially complicates things a little bit more. Um, but yeah, it will be interesting to see whether um, we get another extension and whether BHP wants it enough that they're going to um, be prepared to either change the structure or, or offer more money. Well, times are ticking. We continue to monitor that story. Andrew James is our energy and commodities editor with the latest. Uh, we're going to talk about Toyota now, speaking of sort of more uh, drama and tension. The proposal to re-elect chairman Akio Toyota to his board is coming under pressure by two leading proxy advisory firms, which have advised shareholders to vote against the founding family heir. Let's get more from our Asia Transport reporter, Danny Lee. And Danny, uh, it's always fascinating, these sorts of boardroom dramas, and we know that this is in part why we've seen kind of optimism towards improvement in governance in J Japanese companies. What are the specifics of this situation here? Yeah, I mean, two leading proxy advisory firms targeting uh, the heir to the company. I mean, Akio Toyota, the chairman, uh, the grandson of the founder. And really, this boils down to issues that have flared up, for example, over the past year or re-emerged, uh, certification issues that have, have dogged someone like Toyota. And really, the, you know, the complaints are around, uh, you know, these have all happened under Akio Toyota's watch over his many years, his tenure as CEO. So this is very much a rebuke or seen as a rebuke uh, to the likes of Toyota's board and particularly Toyota himself. Um, but when it comes to these corporate shareholder meetings, these are largely undramatic affairs uh, and with the, the grip and control that um, you know, the top shareholders ha have, really, we're not likely to see much change. But this is very much sending a signal uh, in particular when there are issues uh, that do arise and clearly in this case for Toyota over certification issues and, and ultimately the wider company strategy. What's the sort of outcome here then? What's the most likely scenario that you're, that you're looking at for the vote? Uh, ultimately, looking to see just how much dissent there is amongst shareholders, uh, ultimately, who, who may be following the, 
uh, these proxy advisory firms. Um, you know, last year there was a, an, an, a clearly an uptick in, in, in dissent against uh, the re-election of, of certain directors. So it will be uh, remains to be seen just how much more there is. And, and as you said, with this wider trend of seeing more accountability and demanding more accountability uh, on these uh, Japanese corporate boards, uh, that just still remains to be seen. Our Asia Transport reporter Danny Lee there. We have more ahead here on Daybreak Australia. This is Bloomberg. Let's take a look at some of the top corporate stories that we're following this hour. Chinese car maker BID has unveiled a new hybrid powertrain that's able to travel more than 2,000 kilometers without recharging or refueling. The upgrade means some of the automakers' hybrids could cover the distance from New York to Miami or Munich to Madrid on a single charge and a full tank. The first two vehicles will, of the upgrade will be mid-sized sedans, including the SEAL 06. Official Chinese data suggesting that Apple's iPhone sales bounced back in April with shipments jumping 52% from a year ago levels. Thanks to a flurry of discounts, sales first showed signs of stabilization in March after steep declines in the first two months of the year. Apple and Chinese resellers have been cutting prices since the beginning of 2024, Bell. Yeah, and Heidi, we can be checking some of those big or key Apple supplies at the open markets in the next hour. But also what we're tracking over the next couple of hours is the Aussie inflation data because that's one of the key or highlights on the data docker this morning. We are expecting CPI inflation to have edged a little bit lower in April. Uh, what else we're seeing in terms of the market direction today? It's fairly steady so far. Again, a bit of weakness seen for the Aussie session, but Japanese futures, they bit of upside perhaps. Uh, of course, uh, very little direction really coming from th through from the Wall Street session as well. A lot more of the action was in the bond space, tracking the, the pound versus the yen as well, given we're at levels we haven't seen in about 16 years. But lots of big interviews as well coming up in the hours ahead. We're going to be live from the City Macro Pan-Asia Investor Conference. That's in Singapore, uh, speaking to the head of South Asia markets, Sue Lee. That's in the next hour. And head of emerging market economics, Joanna Chua, joins us later as well. Well, more ahead with the market opens in Sydney, Seoul and Tokyo. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.